When you look up Mia Zapata, her death often overshadows her life. There are countless true crime documentaries that will talk about her murder in detail. These documentaries only interview her friends and loved ones for context and to get reactions to her murder. Yet her tragic end is just one part of Mia's story. People still wouldn't be mourning her death to this day if she hadn't been an extraordinary person. Rather than exploit her death, I want to talk about Mia Zapata's life. My primary sources for this essay are the 2008 documentary The Gits and Heavy Angel by Margaret O'Neill Girard. This book is a 2009 graduate thesis written just one year after the documentary. You can stream the documentary on numerous platforms. Heavy Angel is harder to acquire, as you'll have to use the interlibrary lending program to get a copy from Sarah Lawrence College. Beginnings Mia Zapata came from an affluent family, rumored to be descendants of Mexican revolutionary Emiliano Zapata. Mia spent her early childhood in Detroit, Michigan. Her parents and teachers viewed her as a very creative child. Early in life, Mia was diagnosed with dyslexia, which is a reading disorder. Despite this, Mia was an avid writer. She would constantly be scribbling into her journals well into adulthood. Later, her family would move to Louisville, Kentucky. Zapata had access to instruments at a young age. Often she'd sing with her family or play instruments by herself in her room. Starting from childhood, she was musically inclined. Before becoming part of the punk band, Mia was described initially as a blues singer. Her family talked about a time they went to an open mic night at a bar in Idaho, and Mia blew the crowd away in spite of her appearance. She gained the nickname that would follow her well into adulthood on her awkward stance, Chicken Woman. She even had a tattoo of a chicken on her ankle, thus the inspiration for the name of the final album, Enter the Conquering Chicken. Antioch College. Mia entered Antioch College as an arts major, focusing on painting. At college, she was outgoing and beloved by her fellow students. Her larger-than-life personality was always on display. A good example is how she met one of her future bandmates. Mia ran into fellow student Matt Dresner at a cafe and critiqued him for not painting enough. Dresner would go on to play bass for the Gits. The Gits were formed at Antioch in 1986. Initially, they were a ragtag bunch, but quickly became fast friends. The members included the affirmation Dresner on bass, Andy Kessler on guitar, and Steve Moriarty on drums. Andy, always credited as Joe Spleen on the albums, was Mia's best friend and musical collaborator for the duration of the Gits. Thanks to Mia's vocals and personality, they became hometown heroes on campus. The band name originally came from the Monty Python skit The Sniveling Little Ratface Gits, but was shortened to the Gits. They were a campus favorite with wall-to-wall pack shows. From this time we get the album Kings and Queens. Released posthumously in 1996, Kings and Queens is a collection of demos and early recordings from their time in Antioch. It is rough and unpolished. One instance is the original demo of Cut My Skin, It Makes Me Human. The Kings and Queens recording is less produced and at a slower tempo. This song is a great example of Mia's fierce lyrical prowess. It openly talks about self-inflicted injury and emotional pain. Seattle. When Mia first arrived in Seattle, she wrote to her friend Paul about not knowing anyone, yet yearning to get back together with the band and start making music again. In the documentary The Gits, the band talks about the legendary Seattle freeze, it being particularly hard to make friends in the city, which is notoriously cliquish and passive-aggressive. Mia would stay close with her family after moving to Seattle. She briefly lived with her father when she first arrived in Seattle before moving into the Rat House. In 1991, she would attend her sister's wedding and keep both the dress and the bouquet. Once her friends slash bandmates assembled in Seattle, they rented out a house on 24th and Denny in Capitol Hill dubbed the Rat House. Surviving members of the band talk about how the owner was allegedly a self-proclaimed wizard. Rat House often had wild parties and lended out their basement as practice space to other bands, most notably Seven Year Bitch. The two bands were close, with the Gits initially teaching the members of Seven Year Bitch how to use their instruments. Another band that was close to the Gits was the DC Beggars. Eventually, the Roundhouse would put out a compilation album called Bobbing for Pavement, and would also throw a New Year's party with all of the bands involved. Andy Kessler recalls that Mia often had sporadic moments of musical inspiration, that she would sit down at a piano or grab a guitar and play some beautiful songs, sometimes feigning ignorance of her own ability. Within Seattle, Mia was the center of many communities. It was commented on that she would give encouraging words to homeless people when passing them on the street. Her supportive and outgoing nature made her many friends in spite of the Seattle freeze. According to these streets, the dive bar Mia worked at, the Frontier Room, was near a mental hospital. Because of this, eccentric people would frequent the bar. Mia reportedly said, 
I love my job. I get paid to hear people's problems. The Gits were outsiders to both grunge and Riot Girl. They played too fast to be counted as grunge, and Mia's politics were described as oriented to the personal and the pragmatic. She wanted real change that she could see and touch her in her immediate life. Despite being different from the trendsetters at the time, surviving members of the band had no problem with their outsider status. One story of their early days in Seattle involved the band bribing a local club called The Vogue into letting them play there. While described as shy, Mia was considered by her friends to be a wild one. Bandmates talked about how often she leapt before she looked. A good example is that occasionally Mia would trick someone into letting her drive a car, despite not having a license. In the documentary, a lighthearted incident is recounted in which Mia got lost and insisted she was taking a shortcut. In Heavy Angel, on page 100, note 50, a more disturbing incident is recounted in which Mia almost flipped the van. No matter how he cut, Mia was as punk as it got. Mia was not concerned with fame or appearances. A good example is Kessler claims Mia once unwittingly sassed David Bowie in a parking lot. Whether or not this happened is irrelevant, but the story fits nicely with her character. In the song The Slaughter of Bruce, Mia sings... When I was working in a show all day, the ball came up to me. Said you'll make a star in that bell. I said, so now I'm doing this. Why can't you fucking get it? Cause I... Her disregard for fame is epitomized when she first was approached by music execs and was asked what she wanted. Mia replied, a cabin in the woods, a truck, and a sheepdog. Mia was never in it for fortune or fame. She just wanted to have a good time with her friends. One thing Mia was known for was her extremely eccentric and wildly considered unfunny jokes she'd tell. On stage, Mia would attempt to crack jokes or do impersonations. Alright, one more and we're gonna get onto this night. This is mine. Adrian! <laughs> I can tell you yell anyway, you dog again. <laughs> Matt! <laughs> you scum. I think we all know someone like that in our lives. Frenching the Bully Their first album was released in 1992 by CZ Records. It was dedicated to Stephanie Ann Sargent, the lead guitarist of Seven Year Bitch. Sargent had died earlier that year from drug-related causes. After the album's release, Mia remained modest and humble. She never bragged about being in the gits and was embarrassed when her parents would get excited about seeing her records in stores. Every git song is filled with personal, meaningful lyrics. Each one a story in and of itself. An important song on Frenching the Bully is Spear and Magic Helmet. The song was written explicitly as an attack on someone that was accused of raping one of Mia's friends. Mia sings, You're fucking with my friends! Now I'm out to ruin you! There is no justice! To the crime to get away with! Riot Girl Regarding their genre of music, it is safe to say that the Gits are definitely not a Riot Girl band. Mia had nothing to do with the Riot Girl scene for several reasons outside of the band's sound. For one thing, her bandmates never considered her a feminist. She was older than most of the women in forming Riot Girl bands. Unlike placid and peaceful Olympia, Seattle was considered the more hardcore, rougher city to live in. Mia herself had lived in rougher cities before coming to Seattle. Her lack of fashion and aesthetic didn't match up with Riot Girl's sensibilities. Mia was hard-drinking, hard-partying, sort of preferred whiskey to zines. Mia lived more like a crust punk than a riot girl. European Tour The Gits were introduced to a musician from Holland who offered to help rearrange a real European tour. Initially, they were skeptical, but they received an invitation via postcard. They decided to blow town and dodge the Seattle craze and its superficiality. By the time they returned, the Seattle hype had died down enough for them to resume their lives without scrutiny from the media vultures. One particularly fun story involved the band Dine and Dashing in Switzerland. Listed on page 99 of Heavy Angel, Moriarty and Spada decided to take the van out in search of, quote, real cis cheese, end quote. Instead, they went to see a castle and were off to a diner. This happened before the introduction of the euro, when each country still had separate currencies. After downing several cocktails, they realized all their money was in other European currencies, and that they had nothing in Swiss money. They decided to run for it. Moriarty went out and grabbed the van, and Spada was going to watch the table until the very last second. Mia bolted to the van just as Moriarty tried to pull away, while two large Swiss women with cleavers attempted to yank Zapata out of the passenger seat. When purchasing the Git CDs online, you'll notice that many of them are being shipped from Europe. They most likely came from that tour. Return to Seattle and California tour. The band, and Mia in particular, were known for getting absolutely wasted at the comment. Drinking song from Enter the Conquering Chicken sums up the social aspect of it. I get up! 
The band never drank before a performance, but afterwards was fair game. The gits liked to have a good time and drink till the bar closed, sometimes even trying to smuggle pitchers out under their coats to keep drinking in a nearby parking lot. On page 19, note 39 of Heavy Angel Mia Zapata, Eric Greenwalt recounts a story told to him by Ray Skilton. Ray had a run-in with Mia on the street, quote, brutally hungover, end quote. Ray told her he felt the same way, at which point Mia punched him in the arm and said, well, at least you're alive, tough guy, and walked on. Before embarking on their California tour and during talks with Atlantic Records, Mia's drinking had become excessive. They got together in a car and gave Mia an ultimatum. Cut back on the drinking or the band would go on hiatus. Mia did just that. She would follow through and deliver during their California tour. Enter the Conquering Chicken. Enter the Conquering Chicken is my favorite album of all their releases. In this album, they truly establish their own sound. It is the most unique and well-polished of all their work. Two songs I would cite to epitomize the album are Precious Blood and Bob Cousin O. Bob Cousin O is a song about impatience with life and the anger that comes with that frustration. One of my all-time favorite lyrics comes from this song. It hurts me to be angry, kills me to be kind. Precious Blood is similarly a heartfelt song about struggling in life to achieve one's dreams. Once again, I think the lyrics speak for themselves. There are these things that I want the most But they're usually one step furthest from my reach Oh, but they always stand close enough Take me to the next fucking dress Seafish Louisville In 2000, Broken Records put out a CD called Seafish Louisville it's a collection of live and previously unreleased tracks. The CD has a handful of interactive features and an early digital recording of the Gits performing. Unfortunately, I was unable to screen capture it because I was using an older PC to play it. Final Night. On the final night of Mia's life, her longtime friend and seven-year bitch member Valerie Agnew describes their last goodbye in the documentary. When they met at the Comet Tavern in Capitol Hill, Mia had been psyched by her solo show in LA. The words of Valerie Agnew describing their final goodbye are as such. She was really loving and hugged us deeply, and licked my face and did a Mia maneuver. Legacy. Mia Zapata was more than just a victim or a martyr. She was much more than an amazing singer. She was a real person. Mia was shy and closed off at times. She kept to herself when she wanted privacy, yet she was also loud and boisterous in the center of many communities. These are not contradictions, because Mia is not a fictional character who needed to conform to an archetype. She was a living, breathing woman who was a person before being confined to just a singer and a victim by history. I hope her life inspires you to make music, art, and write stories to just go out there and do it for the joy of it. I hope that when you listen to the gits, so you don't merely sigh and go, what a shame she had such talent. Instead, when you listen, think of the depths behind the person who wrote these songs and sang from the heart. Not into a recording studio, but for all her friends and family. Of all the nights spent drinking at the Comet Tavern in the basement of the Rat House. When you listen to the gits, don't think of a grave you'd weep over. Think of being part of the crowd who came out to see their friends play and have a good time. That's what the music was all about. Piano Improv. This is a song by Patty. S <laughs> yeah, right, Patty. It's from Bessie Smith. It's from her to you. You're right. Okay.